might want to maximize. Yeah, I will when the, when we get there. Um, Chris, you, uh, because I won't be able to see the um, the other people in the room, if there are any questions, if you could just step in and interrupt me. I certainly will. I'll monitor chat. I'll, I'll see what's going on. And then, yeah, I will. Uh, I'll politely interject when there appears to be an Great. appropriate moment. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you. So I'll just give it one one more minute here for folks to folks to come back. Might be good to keep an eye on the chat box as well. That yes, that's my intention. All right. So everybody, tonight we are fortunate to welcome Kevin Marvel, the executive officer of the American Astronomical Society. Uh, he's going to give us a rundown on the history and the future of the AAS and, um, you know, rather, well, actually, rather than steal any or foreshadow any possible information, Kevin, I'm going to stop right there and, you know, want to hand things to you. Um, as we have done for the past uh, several meetings, folks, if you have any questions, uh, please, um, you know, raise your hand in the chat box over here or make a, make a note in chat. And uh, Kevin has agreed that I, you know, he, he's going to focus on his presentation. I'm going to keep an eye on the chat, and when we've got some questions, we'll find a find a good spot to work them in, and we're free to interrupt and ask. So, uh, but I'll keep uh, moderating things and invite you to to speak. So, with that, Kevin, please, the floor is yours, and welcome to Novak. It's a pleasure to have you. Great, thank you for the invitation. Um, I was really looking forward to a couple of days of camping under the dark skies. Uh, in August uh, for the star party where I was going to give this talk, but uh, very happy to give it now virtually given the situation we're in and uh, very good to see as many of you online tonight as, as we've got. It's pretty impressive. Um, one warning, I have a four-year-old who's currently downstairs watching Kung Fu Panda and if he gets bored, he may hop up and, and uh, get involved in our event tonight. So patience, please, and I'll take care of him and hop back on as quick as I can. Um, so what I want to talk about tonight is I'm going to talk about the AAS, which is the American Astronomical Society. And I've been lucky to have worked at the American Astronomical Society almost my whole career now. I started in 1998 after a postdoc at Caltech and uh, finishing my PhD research at the Very Large Array in New Mexico. And uh, I became the executive officer in 2006. And the American Astronomical Society is an amazing organization. Um, it's central to astronomical research um, in our country and worldwide. And we're a lot of different things to, to different people. We're a membership organization, similar to you all. Uh, we're actually a publisher of uh, the leading scientific journals and also just a variety of information. Um, we organize the largest research and astronomy related conferences in the world on a regular basis. We are concerned about the profession of astronomy and we, we, we are the go-to source for advertisements for jobs in astronomy and related disciplines. And we're, we're ever changing, just like you all had a vote tonight on your, uh, on your bylaws. We, we have recently redone our bylaws and, and we're evolving and changing as we need to uh, and as our membership uh, wants. So here's a picture of a typical crowd of the American Astronomical Society at the December 1920 meeting uh, in Chicago. Um, it's an interesting group. First of all, you know it's cold. They're all wearing overcoats pretty much. Um, and hats were more popular back then, which is interesting. Uh, you also find that there are not many women. In fact, there are four in the picture um, that I've been at. Five, actually. I just saw one additional one. And uh, there is one minority. And uh, that's it. Uh, and that would be that would be or two minorities, actually. And that's, that's about 
the ratio that you would have had in the early part of the organization. Now, remember, we were formed in 1899, right around the turn of the century when there was a great flurry of activity in forming nonprofit science organizations in the United States. Many of the oldest uh, scientific societies in the United States started at around that time, the American Chemical Society, the American Physical Society, and so on. Um, and the people who were involved in science at that time were this demographic makeup. Today, this is a more typical picture of the American Astronomical Society. This is a group of undergraduates at, at one of our recent meetings. And you can see that it's roughly 50% women and a much greater diversity of participation. And that's what the field is like. Um, back in the 1960s, there was something like 15% women across all age categories. And now in our youngest age categories, we actually have more women than men participating in astronomy. Overall for the society, it's something like 35%. Um, and our minority participation is growing, but it's still underrepresented compared to the overall population in the United States. So that's something we're still working on. This is a little timeline of our organization. Founded in 1899, there were 114 initial members, so about a tenth the size of NOVAC uh, were the people that started our, our uh, society back then. Um, we did not have any journals until 1941 when we were given the Astronomical Journal. Uh, we, in the 60s, uh, late 60s, early 70s, we formed various specialized divisions, the High Energy Astrophysics Division, people are interested in black holes and supernovas, Division for Planetary Science, people who like to study Mars, Jupiter, and so on, Division of Dynamical Astronomy, who are the people who study orbits and um, characteristics of uh, objects in the universe that can be derived from dynamics, and the uh, Solar Physics Division, who study as you might have guessed, just the sun. Um, in 1970, we got ownership of the Astrophysical Journal and, and the other journals that go along with that, and they were transferred to us. 79 is when we established our headquarters, and that was also the time range when the third executive officer, Peter Boyce, took, uh, took over as executive officer. Um, we then had some additional divisions formed, the Historical Astronomy Division, uh, we started running our own meetings in 1995 with the rise of the internet. We took our journals online. We were one of the first scientific organizations to do so. I started at AS in 1998. We formed the Laboratory Astrophysics Division in 2013. And then recently we've done a lot of work to reinvent ourselves. We've we sort of crossed over the 100-year threshold quite firmly and we decided we needed to reinvent some things. So we formed these task forces to do various activities. One of the highlights of my career so far is that in 2019, I helped uh, the AAS acquire Sky and Telescope uh, at a bankruptcy auction. And we also started a new journal called the Planetary Sciences Journal, which is a, a gold open access journal that I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, when I started at the Society in 1998, we had 12 staff members. And today in 2020, we have 48 staff or contractors, we have more than 100 volunteer leaders and we have more than 8,900 members. So we've, we've grown over time, it's not been rapid, it's been a slow but steady growth, but as you do more, you need more employees and, and that gets harder to run the business. So why does the AAS exist? Um, like any nonprofit, you start out with a, a, a founding charter, um, and it was to promote astronomy in closely related fields that kind of covers everything with but isn't specific enough to get anybody excited. So we formed a new mission statement, which is the mission of the AS is to expand and share humanity's scientific understanding of the universe. That's something I'm really engaged with. I actually have been ever since I was an undergraduate um, showing people Halley's Comet at University of Arizona. And even before that, when I was in high school, um, my, when what shifted me from being a marine biologist to being an astronomer is my mom got me a, a two and a quarter inch refractor at the age of 12, which I took out into the backyard and looked at, at Venus. What do we do? Uh, and my four-year-old is on the way in here. Um, we publish journals. We hold meetings and conferences. Daddy. Hang on, buddy. Daddy, I need to talk to you. 
this one little bit. Okay, hang on just a second. Daddy? Daddy? Yes. What's on? No problem, Kevin. Yeah. I'll be right back. It just takes. No time. problem, Kevin. Uh, the reality of the COVID world. Well, so while Kevin is uh, tending to his child, I wanted to let you folks know that uh, November 8 is going to be the next meeting. And um, so our usual time, 7.30. And again, I'll send out the link uh, is, you know, very shortly here. Our speaker is going to be Jay Pasikoff. Um, talking, who's uh, he's quite an expert on uh, eclipses and such, and he's going to be talking about math, science, and spectacle. So, Kevin, I can turn things back to you. I think I'm back. A mint and some TV should take care of us for another ten or fifteen minutes. Awesome. Um, so, we also do meetings and conferences, public policy and advocacy. We go to Capitol Hill and try and get more money for. Um, for research and to try and do other things like stop the the launch of uh, damaging impact of radio frequencies from satellites or uh, light reflection from satellites and so on. We mentor and train the next generation and we also do some education. Our operating expenses right now after the acquisition of Sky and Tell are about 19 million a year. So we're a pretty big sized organization with quite a lot going on. Now I'm going to flip through a few slides here that is a more or less comprehensive list of everything we do. Um, just to explain why I have gray hair, um, we do an amazing number of things. And like yourselves, we, we mainly accomplish this through the engaged participation of our amateur, I mean, our, uh, our volunteer members who lead various committees, who help us accomplish all the things that we, we try and work on. We do have staff, obviously, at Sky and Telescope and in other areas, finance and operations. Um, but there's a lot going on. So who's a typical member? In the 1950s, nearly all our members were academic professors. NASA started to inject a lot of money around the time of the space race into research, astronomy research. And, and it allowed the birth of a whole new range of people engaged in astronomy research who weren't professors. Um, we have soft money researchers who get grants, observatory or mission researchers, students and retired people, um, and then everybody else like amateurs, educators, planetarium and museum staff and corporate employees. Thank you, Daddy. You're welcome, Grant. Now go, go down and watch your video while okay. I finish talking. Um, I'm going to stay right here. Okay. Because... <laughs> No, you can't eat, have all the mints. You can have two more. There. Okay. Uh, we're a 501c3 uh, corporation, like yourselves probably. Um, that does allow you to do a lot of things without having to pay income tax. Um, we do have to pay income tax on some things that aren't central to our mission, like our job register. And we have to file these annoying tax returns, which are substantial every year. We have a variety of membership categories. We have full members, which are really PhD holders or equivalent. The actual requirement is that you need to be able to write a professional um, peer-reviewed science article for publication uh, in, a, in a research journal. We have student memberships uh, for graduates and undergraduates. We have a range of affiliate memberships. Last one. Uh, for educators, and that is also where we have our amateur membership class, and the, the put the the dues rate there, fifty three dollars a year for amateurs, and we're just getting our heads around what we want to do for amateur members, um, and are forming an advisory committee to help us figure out what kind of services and benefits we'd like to give them. We also have emeritus members and corporate uh, corporate companies and institutions that join as corporate members. The main membership benefits are discounted attendance at our meetings, discounted subscriptions. I'll point out that you can get access to all of the research journals of the society for less than it costs to get access to Sky and Telescope through our member rate. Um, and then you also get discounts to um, 
other products, for example, annual review of astronomy and astrophysics, which is a, a great way to see what's going on in the research Daddy, landscape. You have my with me. Okay, thank you. I know. Now go watch your video. Um, we also uh, support you. Being a member also means that you're helping support the society in our efforts to promote astronomy and related disciplines. So here's our research journals. We have astrophysical journal letters. Um, going all the way across to the Planetary Science Journal, our newest, and research notes of the AS, which is a really interesting new publication that we started, which is basically just extremely short uh, pieces of research that might not otherwise appear in the journals. And it's, it's kind of a nice read. Um, there was one article that I really enjoyed, which was two people's perspective on the last night of observing at the, um, Cal at the JCMT a submillimeter telescope on Mauna Kea, which was quite a good read. And uh, that's free and open for it's anybody to look. Shh, quiet, please. I need to talk to you for a minute. Uh, not right now, thank you. Please. Okay, I'm going to have to have another break here for a yep. second. I apologize. No worries. So, folks, as, uh, as Paul Derby mentioned, now's a good time to vote uh, on the, the trustee motion, if you wish. Um, I can confirm that I did receive the email with the ballot, so it should be in your inbox if you wish. Mm -hmm. I do kind of feel for Kevin. I mean, I'm not all that far removed from having a young one come in and want to interrupt and get some attention while things are going on. Uh, so anyway, one of the uh, questions that I intend to ask Kevin when we get, get an opportunity is to get some his feedback on uh, what are his thoughts on um, the role of the AAS with its new uh, access to amateurs. So we'll, I'm, I'm sure we'll get into some of that as we get a little further on. Hey, Kevin. Hello. Sorry about that. I'm back. Yeah, it's okay. Mine, mine's not that much older. <laughs> it's, real, it's real life around here. So I appreciate Yeah, sure. Sure. Understanding. COVID times. Oh, well. Uh, uh, so this is an example online paper from the Astrophysical Journal. It's actually one of the most highly cited papers this year. A couple of things that are interesting to note. Uh, first of all, it's the gaps and rings in an Atacama large millimeter ray survey of disks in the Taurus star forming region. Um, a great article. Um, a couple of interesting points. We're one of the first journals to show the uh, Asian character names of people. And that's quite important because phonetically there's a lot of overlap, but the actual written characters allow um, unique identification of the author. So it's important to those authors to be able to show uh, their names. These little green circles with ID stands for a new thing in the in scholarly publishing called ORCID IDs, which are again ways to disambiguate authors um, across all of their publication history. And then you can link to the article in PDF form or read it in EPUB. And then you could also read it in HTML format, which is what is displayed here. So quite interesting and powerful online uh, presentation of scholarly research. I'll point out that right now, all the content in our journals is freely available after 12 months. So that means this article, which published in December of 2018, is free to read right now. And I encourage you to go take a look at it because it shows some of the highest resolution images of circumstellar disks that we have available. Other publishing activities that we do um, we publish, we have an ebook series, uh, something like 25 or 30 ebooks, either published or on track to being published, uh, covering a whole range of different subject matter. The current business model is subscription driven, but we're looking to start selling the access to the article, uh, the books individually. So that might be something that you would be interested in. Everything from uh, astronomy education and how to do best practices in learning to the essentials for nucleosynthesis and theoretical nuclear astrophysics and everything in between. This is a really cool new publication that we've started that's free, freely available called AAS Nova. 
and it's published um, in partnership with an organization called Astrobytes, which is a group of 20 graduate students who are interested in becoming science communicators, either professionally or just as an aspect of their professional career. And each week, uh, there are one or two short summaries written in um, non-specialist language uh, about recent articles that have appeared in the scholarly press, uh, scholarly journals like our own, um, and they're, it's more meant to be like a learning exercise, so you can dig into some new thing that you just heard about uh, that got published in our journals, and, and everyone can read and understand it. Um, interestingly, we thought most of the readers would be students or, or amateur astronomers or the general public, and only about a third of the readers are, are those types of folks. Two-thirds of the readers are either graduate students or faculty members in, in universities. So. Everybody likes to have an easy to read summary of a scholarly article, apparently. We also have a really neat new uh, feature, again, free to access, called uh, our AS YouTube channel. And we have interviews with uh, journal authors um, and even Sky and Telescope authors talking about uh, things that uh, they've written about. You see over here, there's one by Ron Brescher, interview with Ron Brescher. 30 minute uh, on an article that appeared in the most recent Sky and Telescope. So I encourage you to go check those out. We also a few years ago um, basically took over Sh and uh, the Worldwide Telescope, which was a Microsoft project. They, they spent, I don't know, $11 million or something developing this thing. Uh, and we took it on uh, as a sort of an oversight role, finished off a lot of the software development and it's um, available free to use uh, for anybody and has a lot of cool functionality, including guided tours and the ability to zoom in and look at things in great detail. And it's kind of a really cool uh, software package that you can access. Hey, Kevin, I got a yeah. question here came, yeah. came through and it's kind of segueing back to some of your your thoughts mm -hmm. from the beginning about the about the shape of membership mm -hmm. uh, in the organization and such. Um, so Actually, Tom Reinhardt, you want to put your question out? You want to go ahead and ask? Sure. Um, it's I've observed professional astronomy has done a good job at increasing gender mix and diversity, but amateur astronomy, not so much. Mm -hmm. How can professional astronomy help amateur astronomy on this? Oh yeah, man! What, um, what do you think was the was the the success or the, the the factors that led to this? Yeah, it's hard it's hard to know exactly. There's a couple of programs that got started at the federal level that I think had an impact. It's hard to put all of our success on just one or two things, but one of the things that got going was at the National Science Foundation. They started something um, for, in summer programs for um, graduate students to or undergraduate students called uh, Undergraduate Research Experience. And um, those got very popular. There's something like 30 of those programs running now across the country, either at um, observatories like the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in, in, uh, in Charlottesville or other places. And they required half of the participants to be uh, women and half to be men. And it required other diversity um, numbers to be hit. And that's led, even though not everyone hit that 50% target early, it's led to a shift where a lot of people come in, a lot of young women come in and they 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 feel welcomed into the program uh, because there are other people like them participating and that makes them more comfortable. And then they're also mentored very successfully and that leads them to coming into the field and then once you have them coming to the professional meetings and giving presentations and people see each other suddenly it becomes a welcoming environment and the numbers start to shift and you can see that slowly and steadily start to change around the time when this these national science foundation programs got started so the advice i would have to say to the amateur community and I'm not going to go into the wide range of other programs that took place at individual universities and departments and um, across the country, which also played a significant role. And also at the society, we had a committee on the status of women in astronomy that addressed these issues. But it's about making a welcoming, open um, environment 
so that everyone feels that they can participate and that even though there might not be a lot of people like themselves participating, there are at least some and they feel that they can, they're, they're welcomed and engaged. And so, for example, tonight you had the nice question from a beginner, which is actually a really interesting question. And she got a great answer and it was a very welcoming answer and, and people were willing to give that. So the more you can be welcoming to people, the more you can make them feel uh, like they're part of your organization or your club as a group of amateurs, the more likely you are to grow the participation in groups that you don't currently have showing up. Yeah, Kevin, no, that's great. Thank you for those thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, I had an, another one I wanted to, to, to follow on with that. You yeah. had also mentioned that you're, you know, you guys are, are, you're taking a look at how you will engage with the amateur community now that, uh, now that amateurs can become a part of, of AAS. What are some of the thoughts that you guys have at this point? What are, your, what are some of the directions you're thinking about going? Sure, so everything under the, everything under the sky, as you can imagine. So okay. um, for, many, for, for our entire existence, um, we did not have a formal route to participation by amateurs. In the early days, it was easier because there wasn't a clear distinction between professionals and amateurs, quite frankly. Um, later, as research became more professional in astronomy and, you know, tools got more expensive, then there was a clear demarcation. And so now we have not, we had not stepped into the amateur space because other organizations had played such a dominant role there. For example, um, the various clubs across the country, like NOVAC, um, the Astronomical League, the um, AAVSO, ASP, the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. And so we had never felt as an organization that that was really our role. And also the old guard of professional astronomers were um, afraid of opening up the doors because they knew that the numbers of amateurs were so much greater than professionals that they feared that suddenly the amateurs would come in and they'd take over and do something, you know, unprofessional or something. Mm -hmm. And the new generation of astronomers doesn't think that way. They, they're they not afraid of opening the doors. They want to be more welcoming. They But they we have to find a way. We're not gonna be able to figure out on our own what it is that might draw amateurs into our organization and to engage with them more. But what we bring to the table is we are the professional research astronomers. We publish the research journals. We're focused on the research side of things. And even though many of us grew up uh, attending star parties and attending um, local clubs like I did in St. Louis for uh, when I was living there, um, you know that's not that's not what that's not what we live day in and day out you know almost half of us are really physicists which you know very few of them came up through the amateur uh, astronomy engagement um and so we're we don't have anything clearly written down we know that we can provide access to the information we've got we know that there's benefit to connecting amateurs who are interested in moving beyond taking pretty pictures to understanding and even you know, observing real astronomical events and contributing to the scientific results and, and study of the universe. And that's what we need to try and find. Um, hmm. We're not gonna try and duplicate the power of an organization like NOVAC, which is a close knit group of people who, who are interested in astronomy and come together on a regular basis to talk about astronomy. But what we can do is we can add an extra layer of engagement that gets you closer to the articles that appear on the front page of the New York Times every so often, closer to the research. And that's what we want to try and find. But we're forming an advisory committee of astro uh, either people, uh, professional astronomers who are deeply engaged in the amateur community, like Stella Kafka, who's the director of AAVSO, or serious amateurs who have been engaged with us, who have been participating either by publishing with us or, or coming to our meetings. And we're going to talk and listen and figure out what are the best things we can we can offer at the current time you can join at a reduced rate you're welcome to attend our meetings in fact i'll talk about that at the end we have a virtual meeting coming up in january that's going to be really exciting um, and might be something you are interested in attending uh, and you can get 
discounted access to our journals and discounted access to Sky and Telescope for a little bit less than what you can probably get it through the club rate um, that you probably enjoy now. Um, but that's all we've got, but there's more to build on from there. So let me let me toss an idea out for you, Kevin. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, this is devolving into a conversation instead of the presentation, but now humor me. Um, when the last few years when I've been able to travel in the US, I've made it a point to try to connect with the local amateur astronomy club wherever we've traveled, because I figure there's a you know, even if it's just grabbing a cup of coffee with some of their some of their leadership, it's an opportunity to connect with a group of people locally who share a passion that, that I have as well. And invariably, we start talking about some of the successes and challenges that our organizations have. And outside of outside of the DC area here, you know, I we 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 sometimes forget how blessed we are with access to experts. Um, Several places I've been around the country say, uh, you know, aside from aside from getting volunteers, their their biggest issue or their biggest challenge is is getting access to speakers for mm -hmm. for the meetings. So it's a simple thing, but a speaker registry may mm -hmm. not be bad. Uh, or, pardon me, maybe maybe a, a welcome service that uh, that you guys could offer to a you know, a broad diversity all across the country. Anyway. Yeah, no, definitely a good idea. And we also have a program that's mainly focused on um, community colleges, but potentially could be expand, expanded to hit amateur clubs, which is the Shapley Lectureship Program. Founded a long time ago. It's very well endowed. We I think we have more than a quarter million dollars in the endowment right now. Um, and that allows professional astronomers from around the country to travel to a community college and give talks. And I know that in the Jay Paskoff, the person you're having yep. next time, for example, has participated in that program. And he makes an effort to reach out to the local astronomy clubs in the local area of the community college that he's visiting. Great. Uh, so actually, Henry, Henry Botcher, a question here while we were talking. Uh -huh. um, he was asking, go get your chair. Yeah, go ahead. Henry's asking, how much astronomical observation uh, is done, you know, now using computers and satellites versus anything that's done with the eye anymore? <laughs> um, nearly everything is done in some way with a computer. Um, but uh, many times at uh, medium sized optical telescopes, people still like to travel. Uh, and do observing through the night. And in fact, you know, I've, I've observed on the 40 inch telescope at, um, at uh, Lowell Observatory uh, multiple times. I'm hungry. At, but at the same time, I have. Um, hungry. Observed. Let me just set something up for Graham yep. here. Be okay. Toy video. Okay, no, it can't be loud. Um, I've observed, I also observe with the VLA and the very long baseline array. The very oh, long gosh. baseline array is 10 antennas that are scattered over the whole country. Yeah. Um, and, and, um, but very, very rarely is any optical, Daddy. optical observing done with the eye. Okay. Daddy. Okay. So. All right. Oh, back over the, to you. Yep. Yeah, and, and um, you know, I'm I'm just going to handle Graham as we go, so bear with me. Of course. Um, so one the, again, like I said, one of the greatest things that I've managed to accomplish um, during my term as executive officer is acquire Sky and Telescope Magazine, which was going through a bankruptcy auction. F and W Media, a magazine conglomerate, um, who I can assure you, after digging into the the details after acquiring the magazine, had completely clueless management. Um, they were losing money hand over fist uh, because of a very bad strategy that they had envisioned. Um, we managed to acquire the magazine and we're just thrilled that we were able to save it uh, and continue it at, under our nonprofit status. Um, Sky and Telescope Magazine, we just finished revamping the uh, website. It's much more modern. It's much more usable. 
Uh, and I hope that you all have managed to use it and enjoy it. Um, our meetings are dynamic, interesting things. Um, it, these pictures are typical of, of the people at our meetings. We get prizes, we get press conferences here on the left. This is the youngest attendee ever at one of our meetings. He was 11 years old and he presented his work. He's a undergraduate student, if you can believe it, at TCU. Uh, one of those rare children who's just uh, a polymath and, and exceptionally brilliant. And he has a younger brother too who attended uh, but didn't present. Um, but uh, then we have receptions and you know we get together and, and celebrate the fact that we're all interested in astronomy. Um, we have a virtual meeting coming up in January. We were going to meet in Phoenix. Obviously, we can't do that. And we have a wide range of speakers available. I uh, really encourage you, if you're interested in astronomy and, and, and have some time in January, uh, to look at it. We have a great program, including Shep Duhlman, who I'm going to talk about in a minute, uh, who is a, a likely to win a Nobel Prize here before too much longer. I'll explain that in a minute if you don't know him. Uh, and then these are the other speakers that we have lined up. Uh, again, uh, Scott Tremaine, many of you may or may not know him, but he's one of the most uh, engaged people working in uh, galaxies and how they've evolved and changed over time, including uh, galaxy clusters and just a really interesting researcher. He's going to win our most uh, notable prize, the Henry Norris Russell Lectureship, and will give a talk uh, at the conference. All the content will be streamed uh, online both the plenary talks, these invited level talks, and each of the uh, contributed talks, which or other panel sessions or all the content will be available. So it should be really interesting. Lisa Randall, I'll just mention another one, pretty well known public face of uh, physics and astronomy, who will be giving a talk. So this is Shep. I've known Shep since uh, 1994. He and I were both working in very long baseline interferometry, and I met him at one of the most cold, uh, coldest weather I've ever experienced in my life in Boston. It was like minus seven uh, and uh, it didn't change day or night. It was always minus seven. Horribly, horribly cold meeting. Uh, here he is looking at, here he, I can't give you any food right now. Here, here he is looking at one of the telescopes that he used to make the, um, Event Horizon Telescope, which is a connected uh, group of millimeter and submillimeter ra wave radio telescopes around the world from the south, from Antarctica, the South Pole actually, to Hawaii, to Arizona, um, a telescope in California where I worked, uh, and over into Spain. And these telescopes worked as a team to image for the first time the uh, a black hole and in fact the black hole at the center of our galaxy and this is the um this is what it looked like uh for simulations so this is the theory this is tells you what the uh hot gas region around uh, a black hole would be looking like this is what you would see with the event horizon telescope if it was actually there and lo and behold this is what they saw um pretty much what was predicted but um what's not displayed all the time on the in the New York Times article was the size of this, which I always try and tell people always indicate the size on your images so that people appreciate what you're looking at. This is the sun. This is Pluto's orbit. This is the distance of Voyager 2 out here. Um, uh, sorry, uh, right in here. Um, and this is the event horizon size. And this is the photon ring, which is and so Literally, they're imaging at the center of our own galaxy, the event horizon of a black hole. Um, and that's the scale relative to our solar system if it was in the same location. So pretty amazing result. Um, obviously, cover of New York Times. He's, he and his team will win the next, uh, a Nobel Prize. We can't predict when, um, but they will win one eventually. Um, this is the latest news. This is um, uh, Andrea Getz is the one in the center, Reinhard Gensel, these are both our members. And they recently were announced winning the, the Nobel Prize for also looking at the black hole in the center of our galaxy where they studied over time. 
where, where they study over time the, what do you want to see? This one? No. How about that one? No. These guys. No. Which one? This guy? No, like no, no, Halloween one. This that one? one? That one. Okay, Halloween, here we go. All right, um, they studied the orbits of stars located right in the center of our Milky Way and measured how they changed with time. An absolutely phenomenal set of observations. It took, took years. You can go online and look at the animation. Um, the animations represent model fits to the measured orbit. So you take a snapshot, you see where the stars are, you wait a while, measure where the stars are again, then you fit orbits to those data points, and then you model the data points, and that gets you what the, the movie is. And so they made the movie, and that's what you see online. And it's phenomenal what you see. You see stars moving uh, right at the center of our galaxy at tremendous velocities around this black hole. And you can measure the, the enclosed mass. You can measure the enclosed mass, and it tells you that there is the only way to explain the orbits is a black Daddy. hole that's sitting there. So it's direct proof that a black Daddy, hole exists. Daddy. Daddy. Wow. Daddy. Yes. Um, Here we are. Yes. Oh. Right. So, I need to go pink. Okay, go in there. Go ahead. Can you come? Yes, okay. I'll come back to astronomy <laughs> under threat after a short bathroom. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. So Kevin explained to me that his wife is a physician uh, at the at the VA, and she's on call tonight. So he's, you know, he's 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 doing dad duty while while his wife is in the uh, is in the hospital with you know, with 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 her work. So that's. And Alan, thank you for the questions you put in. Yeah, those are those are excellent ones that we'll make sure we get in front of them. I mean, it would be quite an opportunity for local amateurs to be able to work with the uh, with the headquarters. Yeah. Right, I, I, and I know they um, they do invite amateurs to help out with the uh, the I'll, I'll put it as the scut work at meetings when they're held locally. Mm -hmm helping with registration and getting the slides ready because they're not doing any in person now. Um, but they have been open to, um, to coordinating with amateurs. And as a matter of fact, at um, the last AAS I went to at uh, National Harbor, um, they invited amateurs to bring telescopes so some of the theoreticians could see what a telescope looked like and, uh, and, um, and see stars. But our, it was a bitterly cold week in Washington that year, and I don't think anybody went outside uh, <laughs> to do it. But but the spirit was there. Sure. So I'm back. I probably will have to hop up and go help in a minute, but I'll try and finish this brief section. Um, so one of the things that we're tracking that we're concerned with is the launch of these low Earth uh, uh, orbiting satellites uh, constellations, which are meant to do good things and provide great resources to all of mankind, uh, but have the downside of interfering with long exposure photography of the sky. So this is an actual photo from Lowell Observatory as the Starlink constellation uh, comes past. Now, there's a caveat here that over time they get more spread out and you don't get quite as big a density of them, but they still are bright and they still come by. And most importantly, this new telescope that's being built in Chile, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, will be horribly disrupted by these, these constellations. And so one of the things we're working on is working with uh, both uh, SpaceX themselves, including having a conversation with uh, Elon Musk, and others to try and find ways to mitigate the impact. So let me pause there while I go take care of a, a mm -hmm. question for my son, and then we'll do some questions from you all.
up to this point, I've been making efforts to find uh, glints and things off the satellites. Okay. At some go. point, we'll encounter enough of them, so there'll be just irritations to us as well doing yeah. uh, optical observation. So let me stop presenting, and then I can just take questions. Sure. Sure. So, Alan, why don't you go ahead? Put uh, go ahead and put 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 your questions out. Those are, as I say, they're, they're certainly very good ones. Up, oh, you're you're muted, Alan. I had Kevin. I had two questions. Uh, two questions. Yeah. Unrelated, m largely. Um, one was: Are there any opportunities for local amateurs to help out at headquarters? Um, obviously, it'd be mostly virtual, but just our physical proximity might mean that you can get some informed support for some of the issues that come up, and uh, maybe communicating with members or uh, making lists of things, or just uh, people who have enough understanding of astronomy so that they know what the business side looks, uh, the relationship to the business side. Sure. Um, we have used, when we have our meetings locally, we have used amateurs to help us with the uh, aspects of the meetings, um, looking at like sitting in the rooms and making sure the AV works, but you also get to attend the meeting for the for free if you do that. So, um, and um, that's one area. We have used amateurs in the past to visit members of Congress to try and make the pitch for increased research funding. And that's an area we're trying to grow a, a little bit. Um, We've occasionally found ways to effectively use amateurs in headquarters, but we've got so many things are automated now that there's there's um, uh, if someone has a good idea internally for when we need, just need some people power, then I'll figure out how to reach out. But looking at the way we do our general business right now, um, there's not a lot that we need done at headquarters that's uh, super um, is a good use of, of amateurs' time. The the advocacy piece and helping at the meetings is really central. And uh, the other question was, and, and you may have sort of alluded to it, uh, is there a way that the uh, amateur membership could be bundled with S&T um, subscription? Because I think, uh, in a sense, both of those are ways to support the organization. But um, amateurs with limit limited budgets might want to do them both and i don't know there might be an even administrative advantage for you to have it done at one time yeah we can we can look at that right now um you know there's a reason sky and telescope was in bankruptcy and that's because they were um their costs were not met by their revenues and so the the low rate that we now have set for our member subscriptions that's really the base level that we've got to charge. So there's no more, there's no fat left. Uh, that's sure. the bottom yeah. line number. So um, we can offer, it's, it's $2 more, I think, to get it through your club, as opposed to being a AAS member. So the only real advantage to being a AAS member, which I encourage people to explore, is being more connected to the professional community, having discounted access to our meeting registration, and most importantly, having that $25 a year access to the subscription uh, research journals. And then you could get your Sky and Tell through your Novak uh, membership um, if you have a discounted rate through there. But um, I wish I could offer them like 50 bucks deal and then you could be, be both. But unfortunately, the costs are what they are. Yep. And, okay. and also, you know, we're still trying to... We, we, the, like the website, the website was horribly out of date and needed to be redone um, and was a real drag on the magazine. And that costs $135,000 to get fixed, you know, to, with a contractor to work through everything. So costs are what they are, which, which I'm uh, sorry about. But that's still, the Python is still sort of digesting the pig a little bit. <laughs> well, you know, the problem is that Skyntel used to have 110,000 subscribers uh, 20 years ago. And now, uh, on a good day, we have 45,000. Mm -hmm. um, and so that that is directly why uh, the finances are so tight. If we had 110,000 subscribers again, we'd be in good shape. Yeah. 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 Um, Paul Severance, you were asking a question here in chat. Do you want to toss yeah. it out? 
Yeah, Kevin, I was just curious on the Starlink, you know, what, what do you think the outcome of this is going to be over time? You know, it doesn't seem like we have a whole lot of leverage with lots of business cases out there that show that these are, you know, where we're headed. But I'm just curious on, on your on your efforts, what, what leverage do you think we really have or where do you see it going? Guilt. Um, guilt is a powerful leverage. Um, and that's why we worked directly with SpaceX um, because they were the leader. And what we what our strategy is, is to develop a what I'll call a good housekeeping seal of approval um, in working with with SpaceX to design their their satellites to really minimize the impact on astronomical research and the degradation of the night sky for everybody, because you can everyone can see them. Um, and so we're hopeful that if we establish a good partnership with with them that we'll be able oh yeah sorry that we'll be able to um to to use that as leverage on every other company that's trying to launch these things and so far i think it's working uh the reason that they put up two modified design uh satellites in the last tranche uh that went up uh, was because we were there talking to them and advocating with them and um We've had numerous, numerous, numerous phone calls. We actually had two or three where Elon himself was on the phone. Um, and I think we're making progress. Nobody, even though they, they are companies and they're motivated by the money at the end of the day, they don't want to be known as the people that destroyed astronomy or destroyed the night sky. Uh, and so at least right now they're working with us. The ones I'm more worried about are the, the very large constellations that the Chinese and the South Koreans are planning to launch. And it's not clear we're going to have as much leverage on those. But again, if we establish an expectation from the community, from the public, that yes, this satellites are give us great benefit, but we also don't want them to destroy the night sky. I think that that'll carry forward to other groups. Cool. Thanks. That was a good, that was a good question, Paul. Uh, I mean, the, Foreign actors are going to be a real interesting challenge to this. Other, as other people are trying to hone in on the space. Yeah. Um, so the floor is open. Does anyone else have have questions for Kevin? Okay, I am not seeing any. So Kevin, I'm inclined to let you. Uh, get back to being dad and take care of Graham. I, he's, he, you know, uh, he, he's been really well behaved, you know, <laughs> considering. At least he asked so, politely. Well, so. I, appreci I appreciate, uh, first of all, I appreciate you guys as a group. Thank you for being out there and gathering people who are interested in the night sky and uh, in a sense of community. Uh, all, the, all the clubs across the, the United States and the rest of the world are really important to the field. They're important to the spirit of astronomy. And so I think that you guys coming together is just a great thing. Um, and second, thank you for your tolerance of my son and this evening's talk. Um, it seems to be a new trend that we're getting used to how to interact with each other virtually, including welcoming you into my house, which is fine, but that comes with some baggage. Um, and I, uh, I really do hope to come to your star party next year and uh, under, under, under clear skies and uh, spend some time looking up at the night sky with you all. Well, it'd be an absolute pleasure to have you. Uh, several people have chatted by here, said, you know, with their thanks and including thank you for saving S&T. Uh, you know, that's near and dear to, 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 to our hearts. Um, and, you know, we would look forward to and welcome another opportunity to connect if there's any way, as Alan suggested, if there's any way that having a large community of knowledgeable amateurs in the DC metro area can help uh, help serve the, uh, the AAS, we'd be happy to have a conversation. Wonderful. I'll, I'll look forward to drawing on you guys at some time in the future. And enjoy enjoy Jay Pasikoff next week. He's one of our best and most engaged members and um, is uh, is just a spectacular champion for astronomy at all levels. So I'm sure yeah, you'll we're enjoy him. Yeah. We're looking forward to it. Okay, all right, great. Have, a, have a good evening. Thank, Thank you, you all. 
So everybody, with that, uh, just a reminder that our next meeting is coming up on November 8th at 7.30 with Jay Pasikoff. Um, again, I'll be sending out the sending out the link a little bit ahead of time and send a reminder uh, right before the meeting so that things bubble up to the top of the inbox. And look forward to seeing everybody uh, for that. And since we do have just a couple of minutes left, uh, you know we uh, we were able to able to help Janet a little earlier in the evening. Um, anybody else have any general questions or anything that you want to, anything astronomy you want to chat about for the next couple of minutes? Yeah, please. Uh, Greg Vaughn, um, I tried to do a little bit of imaging of Mars uh, last week. And what I found is when I put in my 4X uh, 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 PowerMate, onto an 